Trevon Vermouth, uh, irrigation experience began as a young man irrigating on the family farm in Colorado. He is a registered PE, CIC, CID, CIT, and CLIA. Dr. Bob, welcome. Thank you, Mel, and welcome to the webinar. Um, I'm going to take you through a couple of tools that I've developed uh, that I think might help you in things that you are working on, or if you're doing some education materials for people, they should help. Um, okay, you're going to pay attention to me, computer? There we go. Um, the topics that we're going to cover today, part one, will be the pipe size calculator. It's used for sizing pipes in typical turf landscape designs. Uh, it uses the seven most common pipe materials that you would use in a landscape design, and it goes up the four-inch pipe. Uh, I've done this presentation a couple other times, and people asked me to increase the pipe sizes, and I said, well, yeah, one day. But right now, the limit is four-inch. Uh, it has three options. One is the friction method, and that's the method we typically use in lateral design. The velocity method is usually used in main lines, but we should also check velocity in our lateral designs. And the third one is an override. And this method is for a user who says, OK, I don't want to use all those possible pipe sizes. I want to limit the pipe sizes, or I want to pick exactly this pipe size. It tells what the consequences are of having chosen that particular size. In part two, we'll talk about the drip line calculator. And basically, the drip line calculator was developed based on soil physics. Um, Brent Meekham, uh, who was also with the Irrigation Association, and I have been discussing some details of drip design for a long time, and came to the conclusion that there was a lot of folklore there, but maybe not a lot of science. And as it turns out, we've been able to develop what I hope is a useful tool in answering some of the questions you might have in uh, laying out drip uh, lines. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details of how we developed that. Uh, I don't think most of you are interested in it. But we'll also cross-check those against what's being currently used in the industry. Uh, the soil physics things that it takes into consideration, the first is the soil infiltration rates, then the soil moisture holding capacity, the geometry of the water spread within the soil profile. It also requires rooting depth and evapotranspiration estimates in order to give you the end result, which is that it helps determine the proper emitter flow rate and emitter spacing in order to achieve the desired wetted volume without losing water below the root zone. So in other words, you're not blowing water out of the bottom of the root zone. <laughs> so let's launch off here on the pipe sizing part. The pipe sizing is based on methodology that's presented in Foundations of Landscape Irrigation Design 2nd Edition. It's also in Landscape Irrigation Contractor 2nd Edition. And uh, in those manuals, we talk about the velocity method, the friction factor method, and how to utilize those and when to utilize them. So in the friction method, uh, following the methodology of, that's in Foundations Landscape Irrigation Design, it is based on the Hayes and Williams equation. Now, I'm going to show you the Hayes and Williams equation, and then I'm going to tell you that we really, you don't have to worry about that. It's built into the software. Uh, this is the equation that we use to develop the 2008 Irrigation Association friction loss charts. Uh, and if you've noticed in the back of principles of irrigation or in the back of uh, contractor, there are extensive tables uh, for each kind of pipe. And I'll talk a little bit later about why there has to be a different table for each pipe. The equation is really too complex. So that's why we've gone to tables. In the friction method, we follow the guideline that friction loss be a percentage of the total pressure. And usually, we say it should be less than 10%. In the calculator that I show, you can choose the percentage you wish to use. It allocates the losses to the pipe section. 
In other words, uh, if one section of the pipe represents 10% of the total length of pipe, then the amount of friction loss we can use in that pipe is only 10% of the total. It determines the pipe size to not exceed the allocated loss. In the velocity method, there is a velocity limit in pipes, and the velocity limits are derived based on the potential effects of water hammer. And water hammer is the phenomenon that occurs when you rapidly stop water, usually as a result of closing a valve too quickly. And it can damage or burst the pipe. The generally accepted numbers are 5 feet per second in plastic and 7 feet per second in metal. Uh, however, in this size calculator, we're only using copper is the only metal choice. It determines the minimum size pipe needed to not exceed the velocity limit. The I have given the user one more choice, and that's what I call the override method. And here, the user determines the pipe material and size, and the program determines the velocity and the friction loss. So in other words, we've taken away from the program the ability to pick the size, and the user picks the size, but then it tells them what are the consequences of doing that. Now that should be used with caution. What do we need for inputs to the size calculator? First of all, we need the flow in each leg of the pipe, the length of that leg, the type of pipe, the material is being used. And here is a sample layout. Now you might look at this as I give you some dimensions and say, well, that's an odd layout. Well, this is done for pipe design uh, reasons, not for good sprinkler layout. So don't be critical of that. Uh, we're using throughout this that all of the sublaterals are 30 feet apart, and each sprinkler is 20 feet from the main lateral. So that allows us to get the dimensions. And then we have uh, eight sprinklers, each flowing four gallons a minute. So the procedure is to label each leg of the pipe. Now, we would start with the farthest one away, which would be A, or it is, in this case, identical to B. Then we would progress back toward the source. So then C is that leg between the last two uh, sublaterals, D, next one back, E, and F. Now the next step is to determine the flow in each of those legs. Obviously, the flow in, in leg A is four gallons a minute because there's only one sprinkler. The same in B. And if you think about it, uh, you see where my arrow is on the cursor here. Uh, this leg here going to seven, to three, the one to two, to six, to five, and one, those are all identical to A and B in terms of uh, flow through the pipe. They may not be identical in terms of inlet pressure, but they'll be very close. Then in section C, the flow is 8 gallons a minute. D, the flow is 16 gallons a minute. F is 24. And I'm sorry, E is 24. And F is 32. OK, so the next step in the process is we build us a pipe layout chart. And it looks like this. Just summarized it. OK, now let's look at the pipe size calculator. I'm going to go to the calculator live in a minute, but this just shows you what it looks like. OK? And uh, I know that most of us like to just jump in without reading the instructions, but it would help you to read the instructions. For example, up here on line 0, it says, if asked for a password, use user with uppercase U lowercase ser. And what that means is when you try to change a dimension in there the first time you open it, it won't let you until you type user. And then it'll let you make the changes. OK, so step one, divide the pipe layout into sections beginning at the most distant point, which we've done. Determine the flow rate in each, each section and enter those in column C. We've determined the flow rates, and they've already been entered for you in column C. 
and I've reproduced that layout from the previous slide here on the right. So you can see that pipe A right here is pipe A right here, and it is four gallons a minute, four gallons a minute, and is 20 feet long. Okay. Uh, if you don't use a pipe section, enter zero for the flow rate in column C. This is column C. You would enter zero, and then nothing else shows up because it's formatted that way. Um, determine the type of pipe used, and that's from a pull down. And the pull down will be right here. And when I go live, I'll show you how to do that. And then the length of pipe, which we've already put in. Okay, so um, that's sort of a brief introduction. Here are the pipe. Whoop, put up in my cursor. There it is. Here are the pipe choices that you have. Uh, first of all, none, which you see we have some choices down here. Schedule 40, Schedule 80, Class 160, Class 200, Class 315, K copper, and polyethylene. Okay. Bob? Now I want you to pay attention here to two numbers and sort of catalog those. Uh, we will see right here. And let me back up, and that'll flash up again for you that it shows 5.35 as the velocity in section F of this pipe right here. And it also shows that 0.93 is the friction loss in that section of pipe. So remember that or write it down, 5.35 and 0.93. Okay. Bob? Yeah. Hi, this is Chad. Just a quick question coming from Matt Hardegree. Does the shape of tubing affect the friction loss in a pipe, specifically if the friction loss in PE is the same for round pipe and flat oval hose? Uh, it, it does affect it some. Generally speaking, we don't, we don't take that into consideration. It's been a long time since I've done this, but I did some work with PVC where I put curves in it and then looked at what the shape section uh, happened to it. And it, it matters in the laboratory, but I really don't think it matters much in the field. It would matter if you get a kink in it, but I'm assuming we're not talking about that. We're just talking about an oval shape. Great, thanks. Um, OK, so we'll first go through the friction method, then we'll go through the velocity method, then we'll look at the overrides, and we'll point out some cautions which change color, get red cells. We'll talk about available pipe sizes, and then we'll talk about total loss. OK, so. Let's end this, and let's go to our pipe size calculator. Um, this is what the whole screen looks like. Now, I'm going to zoom on it a little bit so that we can uh, see it a little bit better. So let's zoom here to 150%. Uh, get over centered. All right, now, so. The first thing we do is we determine which method we're using. And we're using friction. Just to show you here, you can choose friction, velocity, or override. Okay, So we've chosen friction. In the friction method, you insert the incoming pressure. And this you type in. So in this case, it's 55. We've typed it in. Uh, we normally use 10% of the loss. And that's what I've defaulted to as 10% right here. Okay, And here are the results that you, you will see for those pipe sections that I showed you. Um, and you'll see, for example, that this particular cell, which is H25, has changed lettering to red. And that indicates that the velocity is higher than the limit velocity, which is 5 feet per second. Now, the obvious solution to that is to pick a bigger pipe. Now, what you might notice over here, if it were velocity-based pipe, the nominal size would be 1 and a half in that particular size. So you see that that would resolve the problem. All right, let's go back up here and change uh, from friction to velocity. Now, notice that the velocity square here in the pull-down menu is set light green. It's now light green in this column F. So it says that's what we're using as velocity. The pipe size chosen is 1 and a half now. And the velocity is below the 5 feet per second. Now there's another thing I want to show you here. And that has to do with the pipe type. You might say, well, why did we choose to go to class 
uh, 160 down here and 315 here. And let me show you another thing. Let's switch this to class 200. Right now in 160, the pipe size selected is 1 inch. Let's go to 200. And it changes to 3 quarters. The reason is in most parts of the country, the smallest pipe size available in class 160 is 1 inch. 200 is available in 3 quarters. But 200 is not available in half. So if I made all of these 160, these sizes would be one inch. So watch. OK. Now, it's not absolutely true, because I did a little bit of web searching. And it looks like from some suppliers, you can get some other sizes. But that's the, that's the reason this was done this way. Um, OK, so let's change them back. 315. 15. Okay. Now, let's look at the summary of the table. Uh, in let's go back to friction for a minute. Okay. Now, in the friction method, if we can lose 10% of our incoming pressure, we can lose 10% of our incoming pressure. We can lose five and a half pounds. So the allowable loss is here five and a half. That Five and a half is allocated amongst these pipe sections by the relative lengths. Okay, so there's 160 feet, so 30 of 160 of this five and a half can go here, which is 1.03 pounds. So that's the limit, and that's what we use to pick the pipe size with. And when we do it on friction, we're not looking at velocity; we're simply looking at friction. So we will use a total of 4.78 psi of our allowed 5.5. And I've shown you earlier, if we switch to velocity, then this pipe size goes to inch and a half, as it shows right there. Now, let's say that you're in a situation where you don't want to stock or carry in your truck or whatever, all those different pipe sizes, and that you want to say, OK, I'm only, for example, I'm only going to use uh, one inch and inch and a half. I'm not going to use those other sizes. So we could go to override. Notice in override, everything turns red here, OK? And I've set this up ahead of time that these are all one inch over here, which then transfers to this column. That's the override size, except for section F, which is inch and a half. Now, instantly, you see, well, that velocity is pretty high. Uh, you probably don't want to put, that probably shouldn't be allowed. So let's change it to inch and a, inch and a half. And you'll see the velocity comes down within limits. Um, you might also want to see what happens if we switch materials uh, and what happens with uh, the friction loss. So let's just just to look at it, let's look at class one at this section D, which is one inch pipe, 4.73 is the velocity. Let's change it to schedule 80. Now, that's because Schedule 80 is quite a bit smaller inside diameter, and the velocity goes way up, as does the friction. Okay, So this takes into consideration um, the inside diameters of the pipe. Uh, let me demonstrate something else. Let's go back here and let's do friction-based. And now let's change these to polyethylene because I think many of you, or at least I'm talking to people, lots of people who are using PE. And you'll, think, you'll see things change significantly, uh, both in sizes and in, in velocities. Now, the velocities uh, in this last section are still fairly high. Uh, but using the friction method, uh, 2.99 out of 5. Uh, now, once again, if we wanted to, we could override that and say, I'm only going to use, and you could say here, well, I'm only going to use 1 inch and inch and a half uh, in polyethylene. We could also look at it velocity-based. And here it is velocity-based. And notice that the pipe size has changed. Let me do that again for you. You see pipe size is here half-half. Velocity based, let's go to friction, 3 quarters, 3 quarters. 
Okay? It's a useful tool if you want to demonstrate the difference. It's probably largely academic uh, when it comes to actually actual installation, and you probably have reasons to pick the sizes that you want to pick. Uh, okay, I think that's pretty much the summary. Um, let's uh, let's go over a couple of points that I made here. First of all, the materials. Uh, did I hear you, Chad? Yeah, I, Bob. Question from Calvin Lang. He asks, I'm not sure if I missed something, but shouldn't the flow in pipe leg F be 32, not 30? If it is 30, what did I miss? Oh, uh, you didn't miss anything. You did very well. It is 32. See it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it must have been in my fooling around that I uh, actually changed that. Yes. I'm sorry. I, that, that's an error. OK. Um, no, another question. It's too bad you can choose pipe type to choose the type of pipe for the whole system as opposed to each leg of the system. I think the statement was, can't I choose pipe type by leg? And the answer is yes, you can. OK. Excellent. But see, um, I can change, uh, these are independent. So I can make that K-copper, for example, and I could make this KE, and I could make this uh, schedule 40 and I can make this with schedule 80 and I can make it whatever I want. It'd be kind of a silly system, but you can do it. I have lots of questions here, Bob, if, uh, and, and, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll draw the line here in a second, but just to get to a couple more of these, please plug in override with PE pipe. Uh, okay. The whole setup. There you go. Excellent. Now, I have preset those numbers, so this one you probably want to, probably want to go to inch and a half. Uh, fixes that one, and maybe you want to go to two and fix that one velocity-wise anyway. OK. N next question, what if the terrain is not level? Uh, now, that's I haven't taken that into consideration with regard and the question, the question is, if the train's not level, then that impacts the pressure at some distant point. Uh, and I haven't built that into this. This is assuming that it's all level. Uh, one of the ways you can get around it is to calculate what fraction of your pressure that consists of, and then reduce this percentage. So if it's, let's say you're going uphill from your source, and you you figure that amounts to five feet, that's about two PSI, so maybe that's uh, uh, two percent, and you can make that eight and go from there. Okay, next question. In the velocity or friction mode, can you change the base to pipe size? Yes, only an override. Uh, and what it does is when you go, when you change, I see what your question is, no. If, if you're in friction mode, it sets the pipe for you. If you're in velocity mode, it sets the pipe for you. If you go in override, you can set it. But it will tell you what it would have picked if you had been uh, velocity-based or friction-based over here. OK? You follow that? If it were velocity-based, it would have been half inch. If it had been friction-based, it would have been 3 quarters. But you said 1. So this is what you got. OK. That's all the questions I have for now. OK. Back to PowerPoint here. Um, OK. Now we talked a little bit about the cautions in the red cells. And primarily, that's caution that says you're in override, and it says you've exceeded the velocity. And we talked about available pipe sizes. So in the end, what you're looking about at is total loss. And just to reiterate, uh, I could put in, uh, and maybe I'll think about doing this, is putting in elevation difference. OK, now let's check the numbers. Remember those two numbers you were supposed to write down? It was 5.35 and 0.93. OK? So we're looking at class 160 PVC. And notice here that in the chart, we show 
the three quarter, but it's class 200, and it's shown for convenience. And in half inch, it's class 315, same thing, shown for convenience. When we look at that one leg we were looking at, and uh, I had it mistyped as 30 gallons a minute, which should have been 32, uh, we got 5.35 and 3.1. Uh, 5.35 is the velocity, the same number we got. And the friction loss was 0.93. Now, this that was 30 feet out of 100. This is loss per 100 feet. So 0.3 times 3.1 gives you 0.93. And that's the answer that we got in the spreadsheet. That's sometimes worthwhile to check and see what you really get. Now, if we'd done that right, we'd have been down here on the 32 line, which is 5.71 and 3.49. Okay. Next, we're going to launch off on the drip line calculator. Um, the drip line calculator, based on soil physics, takes into consideration the infiltration rate, the soil moisture holding capacity, the vertical velocity of the water moving through the soil, which can't be greater than the infiltration rate, the soil volume that's wetted. And by the way, there is a terrific YouTube video and if you've got that snap camera thing on your on your uh, viewer, snap it now so you can get this URL for this YouTube video. This YouTube video shows water movement vertically in soils, and it was done about 60 years ago. Uh, some of those things I think we've forgotten about, but it will help you a lot to understand how water moves in soils. Here is a shot from that. And what the uh, researcher has done here is he has the, this is two uh, glass plates here, about an inch apart, filled with soil. And he's dripping water into these artificially formed furrows. What he's doing is trying to simulate furrow irrigation. But he's dripping water. So in effect, what he's got is two drip sources down in the bottom. OK, the first thing I want to show here is what is the shape of the wetted front? from the drip line down. OK, so this is the drip origin point. From here down, it is essentially a perfect hemisphere. Unlike what we see in some of the literature, which shows you an onion bulb shape or a teardrop shape or that sort of stuff, virtually everything I've seen uh, from this source indicates that it's a hemisphere. And that's what we use in the development of the model. Here's what a surface wetted pattern looks like, obviously, in an agricultural situation. Here on the right side, you'll see perfect circles for each one of the emitters. Now, you don't often see land this level, this uniformly cultivated, all that sort of stuff. So it's just a perfect uh, photo opportunity. Here, this one has run longer. Now you'll see that the pattern in between has filled in, but it hasn't quite crossed from one row to the next. And over here, it's run longer, and it's crossed all the way over, but it still hasn't bridged between the sections. This photo was taken by Inge Bisconer of Toro. Uh, looking at the overhead view of a drip wetted pattern, this is what happens in time. So the darker the circles are, the longer time and the farther away from the origin. So at first, they don't overlap until these two get to where they about overlap. Now, it doesn't exactly look like this, because when these two circles overlap, it starts to fill in this gap right here, and that point's not so sharp. But eventually, it develops an essentially rectangular pattern. If you look at it in 3D, this is what it looks like. And generally speaking, uh, well, not always, but often, we're trying to get this rectangular pattern. And it has some things that we are interested in. First of all, what's the emitter spacing, distance between the emitters? What's the width of the wetted pattern? What's the depth to which it has infiltrated? And what is the flow rate of the individual emitter? Those are the questions that we want to answer. The issues in design typically are how far apart are the rows. And that's one that you'll have to make some judgment on but, and maybe use some uh, 
manufacturer's guidelines to do that. Then emitter spacing and emitter flow rate, both of those generally based on soil parameters, deciding how long to run, which has to do both with how deep the water's going and how much you need for EP, and how much wetted area or volume you're going to get based on the decision of do we want to wet the whole surface. The row spacing, emitter spacing, and emitter flow rate go together to form the application rate. And generally speaking, we want the application rate to be less than the infiltration rate so we don't have runoff. Now, that's after the pattern quits expanding. But if the overall application rate is too high, you will still get, uh, it'll, it'll continue to try to expand and then result in runoff. So how do these things interact? The maximum diameter of the wetted area is controlled by the emitter flow rate and the soil until the wetted diameters begin to overlap. The diameter of the wetted area grows with time until it reaches a maximum. And the maximum it reaches is such that the wetted area, well, such that the emitter flow rate divided by the wetted area is equal to the infiltration rate. Once it gets to that point, it quits expanding. The depth to which the water penetrates depends on the following. Run time, soil infiltration rate, and antecedent moisture at start. How wet was your soil to start with? Interestingly enough, it does not depend on the emitter flow rate. But if you think about it, it can only depend on the infiltration rate. The, wet, the width of the pattern does depend on the emitter flow rate. Those are the equations we use to develop this stuff, and you don't need to worry about that. But we are going to worry about diameter and the depth. The manufacturer's recommendations, and this is what I've gleaned out of the literature recently, for three different manufacturers, for three different soils, uh, there is some consistency, but not complete. Uh, and it's largely dependent on what the manufacturer makes because not all manufacturers have all emitter spacing, and not all manufacturers have all emitter flow rates. And you can see that the application rates vary widely from 0.15 inches per hour to over an inch per hour. But basically, what it does is adjust, the recommendations are to adjust the emitter spacing and the emitter flow rate so that the application rate is relatively low for the finer soils and you can go to high rates for the coarser soil. Okay, now let's go to what the model does. And the model says, what information do you need to run this? First of all, you need to know the soil type. And we have characterized soils in five general categories in the Irrigation Association. That is coarse, moderately coarse, medium, moderately fine, and fine. The next thing we need to know is row spacing. And generally, uh, that's dictated by the geometry of whatever you're uh, applying water to. The desired width of the wetted pattern. Do you want it to wet all, wet all the way across, or you only want it to wet part of the way across? What percentage? Um, I think the general number is that we would like to wet somewhere in the vicinity of 70% of the total volume. How deep are your roots? A, de a decent idea how deep the roots are so we don't blow water out the bottom of the root zone. And what is the plant's water use or plant ET? Finally, you need to know system efficiency. Now here are soil properties by type. Uh, this one happens to be copied out of Principles of Irrigation in the IA publication. And you'll see that we have characterized them uh, with course at an inch per hour infiltration rate down to fine with a tenth of an inch per hour infiltration rate. And so moisture holding capacities here, uh, we generally talk of these fractions, where the moderately fine has the greatest moisture holding capacity. Now, you see that flash up at the top? It says provided guidance. What this package does, or this spreadsheet does, is give you some guidance on choices you can make. 
basically emitter spacing. The user must select an available spacing closest to what the software package recommends and the emitter flow rate. The user must select an available flow rate closest to whatever is recommended. And by the way, there may be multiple answers that get you acceptable results. The system calculates the application rate, compares it to the infiltration rate, and then if, it, if the application rate exceeds the infiltration rate, it gives you a warning sign. It also determines the following times, and there are three times. One is the maximum run time. That's the most you can run the system without blowing water below the root zone. The daily run time, and that's what you need to do if you run it daily to meet ET. And the recommended run time, and that's the run time you need to have in order to get the wetted pattern you said you wanted. The spreadsheet Bob. looks like this. Bob? Yes. Just to jump in real quick, I have a couple of questions here. Question number one is, wouldn't higher application rates in coarse soil lead to a lack of spread for the water plume? Uh, no. They, assuming that the application rate uh, is greater than the infiltration rate, and it by definition will, when it's just a finite drop source, it'll spread until the area wetted, or the flow rate, the emitter flow rate divided by the area wetted, is equal to the infiltration rate. Okay. The second question, just because the IR is one inch per hour, shouldn't you apply slower to not risk waste to gravity? Um, yeah. It, I wouldn't say that we, if, even though if it'll take water in an inch an hour, generally speaking, I wouldn't want to put it on that fast because anything that happens to soil, uh, virtually anything that happens, compaction or surface seal or those things, all slow it down. So yeah, uh, that would be good advice. Next question. I'm assuming the soil physics is based on Richard's equation. Also, what storage model is assumed for the water holding capacity? Uh, the, uh, no, it's not based on Richard's equation. Um, it's uh, more like Darcy's law. And uh, I'm sorry, what was the second half of that? Also, what storage model is assumed for the water holding capacity? Uh, the water holding capacity assumes that you have started uh, at uh, your management allowed depletion uh, and, and filled it, and that, that would be at 50 percent, and you fill it back to capacity. So it will hold 50 percent of the total available water. Great, thanks. Okay, so here's what the spreadsheet looks like. Uh, now, let's go to the spreadsheet itself. And you see I picked a, a medium soil. And by the way, I've superimposed the manufacturer's recommendations over here just to, just to test it. Now, bear in mind, this thing is to give you some guidelines. Okay, but medium soil, and, and in this particular case, we picked row spacing of 18. By the way, uh, yellow are areas where you need to put things in. Uh, this sort of... Uh, Transitional blue is where you can select from. So, okay, you can select, and you'll see there are five course or five soils there. Um, so, you input the soil type there. Uh, the row spacing is 18 inches. The width of the uh, desired pattern is 12 inches. Root depth is nine. You have an ET of 0.25 inches a day with an efficiency of 90 percent. This then said, okay. Uh, the green is the recommendation. It says you should pick seven um, gallons per hour. I'm sorry. You should pick, pick an emitter spacing of seven inches. Well, we, have, we go up here and we try to match that. These are the typical emitter spacings. The closest we can get is eight. And then it says your recommended emitter flow rate is 0.24, and the closest one that's available from the manufacturers is 0.26. Now, you'll see down below that it says the maximum time you can run this one is 3.9 hours before you blow water at the bottom. Your daily run time is 40 minutes to meet ET. Your recommended time is 69 minutes to get the width of the water pattern you asked for up here. It cautions you that the application rate exceeds the infiltration rate, which it does. The application rate is 0.42. The infiltration rate is 0.40. I wouldn't get too excited about that. It says the recommended 
uh, runtime exceeds the maximum daily runtime, which is this number here exceeds that one. And yes, in order to get the width of the pattern you want, you probably have to run longer on alternate days. Okay, let's change the soil type. Change the soil type to fine, and you'll see, <coughs> oops, I didn't change it to fine. Okay, change it to fine. You'll see that the emitter spacing is wider. And emitter spacing, as you go from coarse to fine, if you look at all of three manufacturer recommendations, do increase. They don't necessarily agree, but they increase. This says, well, you should pick an emitter spacing of 15. So let's see what we can get this close to 16. All right. Uh, now it says your flow rate recommended is 0.12. Let's pick one that's closest, which is 0.13. Okay. You notice when I did that, that that caution below that your daily runtime, um, the recommended runtime was greater than the daily runtime, that went away. Uh, now you say, well, why do I have to run it so long? And the reason is because your flow rate's so low. Uh, but this one, you could run for 18 hours before you blew water below the bottom of the rip zone. Okay, let's look at course. Now you'll see the recommendations change significantly. This one, if you look at coarse soils versus uh, fine soils, the emitter flow rates are always higher on the coarser soils over here than they are on the finer, fine ones, okay. The recommended emitter flow rate is 1.24, and I think the highest I have in there is 1. And it says the emitter spacing recommended is 9, and we'll go to 8. Okay, now that got us cautions because we're putting it on way too fast. And the recommended runtime exceeds the maximum daily runtime. But the important part here, I think, is what's the longest you can run this system on coarse soils before you blow water out the bottom? is only six-tenths of an hour. Now, I wouldn't guarantee that these things are exactly right for your soils because we've used some generalized characteristics. But it gives you some general guidance. Um, let's see here. I covered the points I wanted to cover. Yeah, uh, Bob, I have a couple of questions here for you. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to cover uh, just a couple of questions relating to the drip line tool, and then we're going to go back uh, for a question on pipe sizing. The question is, if he gets a chance, can you, Bob, repost the YouTube video web address? Thanks. Uh, sure. Uh, I'll have to, uh, Chad, we can talk about where to put that. Yeah, I can do that. Very good. The next question is, can Bob explain one more time what Tmax is? Tmax, right there is the maximum time you can run that emitter system before water penetrates below the bottom of the root zone. So you said your root depth here was 9. Let's just change this to 12 and watch Tmax increase. Okay, Tmax went to 1.3 hours from, uh, uh, what was it, 0.6 or something like that uh, when we had 9 in there. I forgot what the number was. Point. Oops. Yeah, put that in the wrong column. Let's try to get it in the right column. Oh, okay. It was well for this situation is 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 one hour before it goes beyond nine inches deep. Now let's put twelve in here and see what happens. And you see it's one point three. Um, it's not directly proportional, and the reason is that the bottom of that wetted pattern is a hemisphere. So it doesn't change linearly with uh, depth. The, I hope I got. I hope I answered the question. Good. Good. Next question: When you, or rather, when your app rate exceeds IR, isn't a cycle and soak program the way to go? Uh, yes. You know, the answer is yes. Um, we generally don't think about using cycle and soak with drip, but certainly we could. And in, anything that happens that decreases that infiltration rate is going to make the problem worse. So yes, I agree with the cycle of soap. Um, it won't be quite as effective, uh, but it'll work. Good. Good. We have a couple of questions here about, first of all, about the PowerPoint 
presentation. Can folks get a copy of it? I know we're going to post the entire presentation today uh, on the IA's website so you can watch it again. In terms of getting the actual PowerPoint, Bob, uh, I'm going to have to refer that one to you. Um, let's talk about that, Chad. I don't think there's anything in there that's an issue, uh, why we wouldn't be able to, to do it. But uh, as you know, all of our Irrigation Association materials are copyrighted. Right. Uh, but we might make it available in PDF. And Good. certainly you could, you could look at the, uh, uh, re-look at the webinar. Excellent. And the question is, are these drip calculators available? And, and the answer I know is yes, they're on our website. Yes. And that is this question right here, where to get the information on pipe sizing. Um, here is the uh, URL for it. That's available to IA members. And the drip line calculator is also located in the same spot. If you go there to that URL, you will see that there's a lock beside three of those things. And that means you have to be a member to download it. But yes, you can just download those programs. And if you find things that you don't like or think are wrong, uh, you know, I'm a human being. And uh, several people have come back and said, hey, fix that. And I'd love to hear your uh, comments on it and say, uh, I like this. I don't like that. Can you fix this? Great. Bob, I'm going to get to two more questions here, and then we've got to, uh, to move on to a couple other things. Uh, the question is, what do you do when TREC is higher than T daily? Uh, run of alternate days, uh, or maybe every third day. Uh, basically, if you want to get that with, with your wetted pattern, and, and, and you, in that amount of time to get it, it's greater than the recommended time for the day just run it every other day or maybe two out of three days and you'll generally get to the width of your wetter pattern. Do Good. A little math on it, but yeah. Next question. There are more than three manufacturers. How would you add or consider others not on the drop down? Uh, the only one these are the only ones I could find the recommendations for uh, spend, emitter row spacing, emitter spacing and uh, emitter flow rates. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of manufacturers out there. If anybody else has got any other data, I'd love to look at that too. Okay. All right. We're going to do we're going to do just one more question here, and I'm going to have to uh, to go back to a question relating back to the pipe sizing tool. If lines are going uphill, wouldn't it work to just reduce the initial inlet pressure by the loss for elevation? Uh, yes, but. It probably will dictate that you have bigger pipe sizes in places you don't necessarily need them because it, the, by reducing the inlet pressure by the elevation, it also reduces that uh, amount, that window you have to work with. But yes, it would work. OK. Great. Excellent questions. I know there are some I did not get to today. And so what I will do for those of you who have asked questions that I didn't get to, I'll forward them to Bob, and I'll let him get back to you. That would be fine. Bob, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity, and I look forward to hearing from you. OK. Really appreciate uh, everybody's excellent questions and participation today. We're in the middle of a conference call, and I thought they were going to let it go. Okay. Well, at this point, per Mel's request, I'm going to jump in and very briefly go through uh, just some current events that are going on at the state level, particularly the California drought and, and uh, what's happening there. Um, and in the process of doing that, we'll update you on some state issues and, and give you an uh, opportunity to ask a couple of questions. We're going to make this very quick. Okay, moving into my presentation here. Okay, in California, we are in the middle right now of a very significant drought 
that the governor of California declared last month. And I have some photos here that you're looking at that demonstrate the severity of the drought. You can take a look at the dry lake beds where reservoirs are dwindling in, in certain parts of the state of California. And the map on the left, or rather the right side of your screen, which comes from the U.S. Drought Monitor, shows that the most extreme and exceptional conditions of drought exist uh, in, uh, in many parts of California. Okay, so California mitigation. What is the Irrigation Association doing right now in California to assist with mitigation that would enable folks to continue to irrigate and continue to install irrigation? Well, what we're doing is we're working directly with water districts who are considering uh, drought restrictions that would eliminate irrigation or eliminate access uh, to irrigation. And what we are recommending for water districts across California right now is that they consider some alternatives to encourage best management practices instead of simply eliminating irrigation rights. And so you're looking at them on your screen right now. What do we recommend? Well, we recommend hiring a qualified irrigation professional for irrigation system installation and maintenance. And these qualified individuals include irrigation professionals certified by the Irrigation Association Select Certified Program. Irrigation professionals certified by the California Landscape Contractors Association Certified Water Manager Program. And then finally, California State Licensed Landscape Contractors, which include irrigation contractors under California statute. Number two, installing efficient irrigation products and technologies is uh, a requirement that can mitigate uh, the elimination of irrigation rights such as drip irrigation, microspray, and irrigation smart controllers labeled by the US EPA's WaterSense program. And finally, having an irrigation system audited for distribution uniformity and checked for underground leaks, which we know from research is a significant problem with aging irrigation systems. If necessary, systems should be repaired by qualified irrigation professionals. So th here's our th here are three action points that represent best management practices that can be uh, supported by water districts in California and uh, as, a, as a means of avoiding outright irrigation bans. So the other thing that California is talking about right now is the public financing of water infrastructure. And in California, the water bond, which is currently being considered and is probably going to move through a few incarnations before we get to the final document, would be an $11.1 .1 billion initiative to upgrade the state's outdated water system. The project is necessary to increase California's water resources. After a decade of drought, large population increases, extreme pressures on farmland and needs in the nation's largest irrigated landscape sector. So, you know, the majority of that one, that $11.1 .1 billion program would be for system operational improvement, and that would include projects like dams, reservoirs, and canals. And uh, one in particular is the Freont Dam Expansion Project near Fresno, California, which represents the headwaters of the Freont Canal System, Millerton Lake. This is the irrigation lifeblood of the ag-rich Central Valley of California. So if you look at your screen, you can see what is being proposed. It's a secondary dam that would increase storage capacity. What does that mean? That means when you have exceptional rainfall events, and this graph shows exceptional rainfall events in that watershed from 1977 to 2007, represented by the blue color. When you have these exceptional rainfall events, you're actually able to capture them instead of losing them, as you do with 450,000 acre feet in annual releases from this one system. And bear in mind, there are multiple systems like this of storage capacity that have been proposed throughout the state of California. So that would take, for this one project, $4.1 billion. So you can see the need for infrastructure investments in California's water system, which is the most man-made and, and man-maintained water system in the world, are quite significant so that we can prevent future drought situations like we're in right now. You know, we're dealing with drought situations around the country. Texas continues to, to have drought conditions that, that persist in various parts of the state. And we have a good model that we've worked on in Texas 
called the Texas Water Smart Coalition, where we partnered with a number of other organizations and companies and associations and with the state government to promote best management practices directly to the consumer so that they can change some of the habits of not understanding their irrigation system, not having it audited, not having it serviced or maintained, and move from that to a model of active engagement in taking responsibility for efficiency and water conservation at the home level. So that's what we're doing on drought around the country. We're continuing to work on licensing initiatives around the country. Alabama, in particular, is moving forward with state licensing right now and is getting closer. And we're supporting that effort. And you know, there are there are a multitude of laws that we're following and and, and tracking around the country that. Uh, take a look at, at various issues related to water restrictions and drought. So uh, to, to sum it all up, and I have a lot more I could talk about but very little time, that's some of the, the state issues that we're working right now around the country. And we are, uh, we're happy to uh, continue to do that and to work with you as members of the Irrigation Association on specific issues in your part of the country. And with that, Mel, I am done. Let me unmute my phone so none of my background noise gets through to you. Uh, wow, I appreciate all of this great information. Uh, Dr. Bob, thank you. My hat is off to you on uh, all of the knowledge uh, that you bring to the table and, and was uh, instrumental in making this happen. Uh, and Chad, uh, some, some of us in other parts of the country don't realize how uh, bad it has gotten in other areas, so I appreciate your insight as well. Ladies and gentlemen of uh, the conference or the webinar. I do appreciate y'all participating and uh, look forward to hearing and seeing more of you with the Contractor Common Interest Group. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for your participation. Have a great day. Thanks, Chad. See you.